Hello, 8th graders in confirmation class. I hope that you guys are doing well today. I am here, Pastor Paul Muther here, and we are going to look at the baptism section that is lesson 21 in your confirmation curriculum. So I'd invite you to take that out, take your confirmation curriculum out, and here we go. Right, so we're going to be putting together all of the things that we've understood and learned about baptism, all the, from the Old Testament. We're going to put them all together in this lesson. We're going to look at two different narratives that you remember, the narrative of the flood, and then also the narrative of the Red Sea. And we're also going to go into the New Testament as well, in two different ways. Way number one is that we're going to look at how baptism that we've talked about in the Old Testament uh, is renewed and rejuvenated in the New Testament, the way that Paul talks about it. And then, second, we're going to talk about how, how when one is baptized because one is baptized, therefore, we act in a certain way on that identity. All right, so let's get to going. Uh, number Question number one right at the top there, what is baptism? This is straight out of your catechism. Baptism is not just plain water, but it is water included in God's command and combined with God's word. What are the benefits of baptism? Baptism works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal life to all who believe this. These are straight out of your catechism answers right in the first section of your catechism that baptism is not just plain water, even though it can't happen without water, but instead it's water that is combined with God's word and included in God's command. God says baptize, and so we do baptize. God says uh, that we should say his name in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and that combined with the water gives the benefits that God says it gives. The benefits of baptism, the forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal life to all who believe, as the words and promises of God declare. Next question, how has God saved his people through water? And the answer is that in baptism, God uses, let's see, what is the answer here? Um, <clears throat> in baptism, God uses water to save his people. And it's not the only time that we've seen God use water in order to save his people. We talked about two of these narratives in our lessons previous, and the first was the narrative of Noah and the flood. You remember Noah from the covenantal language, right? That God made a covenant with Noah. He put his bow in the clouds and said, never again am I going to send a flood that's going to wreck the entire earth. But there's also more to that as well. In the flood, we find that the world was corrupted, right? This is straight out of lesson number four. Um, in the flood, we find that the world was corrupted. In the flood, we also find that God washed the world of its corruption. Oh, that's not an apostrophe sort of a position. There we go. God washed the world of its corruption, saving eight in all. There are very few that were saved that day. It was Noah and his family, eight souls in all. And finally, God renewed creation. But you know the end of this story. Uh, but it became corrupted again. All right, so that's the flood narrative, and that's one that we know well because we've studied it already. And then we also looked at how that compares to baptism. You see, in the New Testament, the New Testament authors compare the flood of the Old Testament to this new promise, this new covenant that we have in baptism. In fact, Peter does that in his first epistle in the third chapter. He says there that we were corrupted. Not only the world, not only the stuff that's around you, but you are corrupted. Uh, that's something that we confess in our baptismal liturgy, that we are corrupted even from birth. Uh, second, we find that God washed us, saving 
all who are baptized. Right? Uh, this is a good place to remember that when we're talking about things like baptism, uh, this all falls under the idea that we in Christianity like to call typology, uh, which is a fancy word to say from the lesser to the greater, right? Uh, it's kind of like if you um, went up to your parents, you might say something like, if you really want to go to a concert on Friday night, you might say something like, dearest parent of mine, I have been faithful in the lesser tasks. I have taken care of my dear little brother. I have been washing the dishes for you. And if I can be faithful in these lesser things, then I should be faithful in greater things like going to a concert on Friday. Uh, then I can be faithful in those greater things as well. It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. And that's what we believe the flood is to baptism. Flood is the lesser, and baptism is the greater, right? And so, in baptism, it's not just the world that was corrupted, but we are corrupted, body and soul, we are totally corrupt. Two, and it's not just that God washes the world of its corruption, he, he washes all of us, all who are baptized, and it's not that he just saves eight, he saves everyone who has been baptized. And finally, um, where, the first, where the flood was only for a time, that is to say, God renews creation. Oh, my mouse is going crazy here. Um, not, not only does God renew creation like he did in the flood, in baptism, God brings new creation because... He unites us to Jesus Christ. Not just once, but once for all. And so we see this move from the lesser to the greater in this story. The story of the flood helps us to better understand that in baptism we are brought from death and destruction and made alive in Christ. Oh, I'll let you see that. Um, it helps us to better understand that we are brought from death and destruction and made alive in Christ. All right, so the other big thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this up here a little bit so that you can write it down if you need to write it down. Uh, the other big thing that we talked about in relation to baptism was another story, not just the story of Noah and the flood, but also the story of the Red Sea. All right, so you remember the Red Sea event, what I'm talking about? You remember that's after Genesis. It's in the book of Exodus, the book where God redeems his people from slavery to Egypt that foreshadows their slavery to Babylon and Assyria and foreshadows even their slavery to death. And so we see that this, the, this comparison between the Red Sea event and baptism gets in that same category. So, um, we last talked about Noah and the flood. Now we're going to talk about the Red Sea event. That's Exodus 14. You might remember that after ten plagues, God, uh, Pharaoh let uh, God's people go, and then they went all the way to the edge of the Red Sea, and they stopped there. Pharaoh's army came right up on behind them. They were going to slaughter all of the Israelites until... God provided a miracle through Moses and the people went through the Red Sea on dry ground foreshadowing this washing of holy baptism. All right? So the Red Sea event is the lesser and baptism is the greater. Exodus 14 is what we're looking at here. Uh, so we look at the Exodus event, right? Uh, they passed through water from slavery to freedom. All right, so the people of Israel, they pass through the water, through the Red Sea, which is the water there, from slavery, the slavery of Egypt, to freedom, to the freedom of God leading them to the promised land. Number two, God claims Israel as his firstborn son. God claims Israel as his firstborn son. He says, today I have begotten you. You're mine. I've redeemed you, right? And then third, uh, they go on to a place of worship, Mount Sinai. So notice that, that in the Red Sea story, 
the end of the story isn't that they simply get baptized or they, go, they pass through water to freedom and then everything's hunky-dory and they never have to do anything ever again. No, in the Red Sea story, they go through the waters that save them onto a place of worship. All right, so let's see how that compares to baptism once again. In baptism, um, in baptism we find that it washes away slavery to the kingdom of of the devil. It washes away our slavery to the kingdom of the devil. Uh, second, it joins the new Israel into the body of God himself. So in baptism, right, it's not that just, God just claims Israel as his firstborn son. Instead, he joins us into Jesus Christ. We get to participate in Jesus Christ. We get to be the body of Christ, who is, by the way, God, right? So um, we are joined to Jesus in our baptism. And then third, baptism brings us to a place of worship, of worshiping, the triune God, right? Just like after the Red Sea event, they went to Mount Sinai. So through baptism, we go to a place of worshiping the triune God. Now, if you need to pause it right here, you're welcome to pause this video and then take all those things down. Um, and we're going to keep on a moving and a grooving. And so... Where did the people go and what did the people of Israel receive after they crossed the Red Sea and went to Mount Sinai? Well, they received freedom. They went to Mount Sinai to a place of worship. They went to the promised land after that. In baptism, you are freed from the ultimate slavery to death. Because, because you join Christ in his resurrection. In baptism, you are freed from ultimate slavery to death because you join Christ in his resurrection. All right, so we've gone through the Old Testament narratives that we already went through the first time we learned them, and the second time we're thinking about baptism especially as we think through these narratives. Uh, this, uh, after this, what we're going to do is we're going to, whoop, wrong page, um, we are going to, ah, uh, there it is, to the build section. So I'm going to get my Bible and follow along with you guys here. There are two particular passages in the Bible, in the New Testament, that talk about baptism and do the kind of comparing that we are doing here. And the first one is in Romans chapter 6. This is one of the clearest places where we see Paul, the apostle, talk about baptism. Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 4 and 5. Uh, I have that up here. I'd invite you to get there as well. Um, the directions for this section are, one, look up the following New Testament passages and write down words or phrases that echo the typology above. All right, that means write down words or phrases that make you think of, right, the flood as we've described it from lesser to greater and the Red Sea event as we described it from lesser to greater, right? Do, we, do I hear us being united with Christ? Do I hear us coming into a place of worship or walking along in newness of life anywhere? Do I hear us being made alive or renewed in Jesus Christ? Do I find that baptism is once for all? Right? Those are the sorts of things that I want you to write down in each of these passages. Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. We were buried, therefore, with him. That is to say, we join him. Uh, we are buried, therefore, with him. We join him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might rise from the dead. This is what it says. We too might walk in newness of life. We too might rise from the dead and come to a place of worship. 
Uh, so, number one, write down words and phrases that echo the typology above. When I think of the typology in here, I think of that joining with language, right? That we join into the body of Christ in this passage, that we join Jesus in his death so that we might join him in his life. I also think about um, how we go to a place of worship here, right? It isn't that, oh, I'm baptized now and so everything's hunky-dory. No, we are baptized so that we can go to a place of worship. So that we can worship God with our whole heart, with our whole mind, with our whole being. So that every single part of our lives is a response to the grace that he has given. All right. Write down words or phrases that echo the typology above. And then which of the, our list of themes, and that's themes from Isaiah 1, 2, and 3, those lessons, which of those themes do we find in these passages as well? And so, I'd invite you to think about that. I'd, I'd invite you to think about how, how uh, in this one, that uh, we are raised from death to life, that's kind of reversal, isn't it? Uh, we were dying, we were going down into Christ's death with him, but, right, but Christ was raised from the dead, and so things are not as they seem for us. I invite you to do that for Romans 6, verses 6 through 11. You're going to see a lot of similar themes here. It's not going to be all that different from Romans 6, verses 4 and 5. But I want you to read through those five verses and do the same thing. And I'll go to Colossians as well. I'm going to read a little bit from Colossians as well so that you get a flavor for that book too. So those Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians. All right, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks to God the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the light. Now, notice that qualified language, right? That sounds a lot like, um, well, uh, that's the language of inheritance, right? He has qualified you to share in the, in the inheritance of the saints of the light in light. He's qualified you. That is to say, he's called you a firstborn son because a firstborn son gets to inherit all of his family's money and land. And so that's a lot like the Red Sea language that we've been using, that uh, in the Old Testament, God had declared Israel to be his firstborn son. In the New Testament, you are joined with Christ and you are qualified as you join with Christ to be worthy of the eternal life that Jesus Christ has won for you. Uh, he has delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. Right, that's again uh, Red Sea language, isn't it? It's you're going from a realm where you are in slavery, passing through water, and then going into a place where God has called you his one and only son in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So I want you also to think about, well, what of the themes we've been reading, trying to listen for these themes that we see in Isaiah 1, 2, and 3, what of those themes do you hear there as well? The other passage in Colossians, this is Colossians chapter 2. It says verses 9 through 15. I really want you to uh, focus on verses 12 through 15. Out of those, I want you to focus on 12 through 15. All right, so that's the build section, and um, I'm going to go to the took section now. In baptism, you are given life, salvation, and forgiveness. Woohoo! That's good. That's really good, right? Romans 11 says, by the way, this is part of your reading from the build section, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The other way to say that is that your baptism is supposed to remind you to do stuff. You aren't supposed to just sit around like a lump on a log. You're supposed to do stuff because of your baptism. But what stuff is it supposed to remind you to do? Four or five, one, two, three, four, I can count. 
I have four examples for you in Acts chapter 16, Romans 6, Colossians 3, and 1 John. That's the first letter of John. That's way at the back of your Bible. 1 John chapter 1. And I want you to answer or finish that, uh, finish that sentence there in each of these cases. Because they were alive in Christ, therefore Paul and Silas, well, what did they do? Because I am alive in Christ, in Romans 6, therefore I will, well, what is Romans 6 asking you to do? Colossians 3, because I am alive in Christ, therefore I will, dot, dot, dot. And 1 John 1, because I am alive in Christ, therefore I will, dot, dot, dot. You see, the great truth of Christianity is not that you have to follow the Ten Commandments so that you can win heaven in the end. The great truth of Christianity is that you've already been baptized. Because you are baptized, because you're part of the body of Christ, because you have shared in the inheritance of the saints in the light, because Jesus Christ died for your sins and loves you eternally, because of all that, therefore, let's act in a certain way. Let's love our neighbor, right? Let's care for those who are hurting. Let's lead others to Jesus Christ. And so I'd invite you to look through those passages and answer those questions. That's all that I have for you today. I hope you have a great day, and I hope that this is interesting. If you have any questions or comments, send me a text, call, or send me an email, and I will respond. All right, take care.